then uh, let's start with the last part of this uh, symposium. And uh, now we're actually moving to the second stage. Like the first stage of the symposium was the uh, academic part. And uh, since this is also part of a larger research program, uh, which is funded by the German Research Foundation, um, Lars Köln and I uh, and Matthias, uh, who are organizing this event, we're always thinking we have to give something back to, to society who actually fund this uh, program. And so we would like to start off with a short introduction of uh, what we have accomplished this year. And then you will probably all looking forward to hear this year's keynote speech by, uh, speech by <coughs> Rick and Molly. And uh, so let me first of all welcome everyone who uh, uh, just attends now and hasn't been part of the academic uh, conference this year. And uh, as you might know, um, crowd investing in Germany actually started in 2011, so we are now in the sixth year. We are just moving in the seventh year itch, uh, so in, in every good marriage, as you might know, in the seventh year everything falls apart. <laughs> but uh, as far as I can say, for the crowd investing market in Germany, this is so far not the case. Um, so, um, as you might have realized, uh, we are having this crowd investing symposium now for the fourth time, and this year actually we first, uh, for the first time, uh, we opened it more up to financial decision making in the internet because we believe that fintech is really an emerging barrier, and we shouldn't really focus only on, on crowd investing. And uh, as, as you might have realized, a couple of papers that have already uh, yeah, targeted this topic, like uh, fintech, but also social trading, have been part of the conference. And I think uh, we're going to continue with that, and like, we'll have the uh, symposium more open also in the future on that. Um, so now we are uh, in this open session. And uh, before I start with the latest findings, uh, let me briefly tell you how we're going to proceed. So in the first step, I'm going to briefly say something even shorter than the uh, slide presentations on a couple of our uh, recent papers. And then Ethan will have the uh, keynote speech, and we are very much looking forward to what he has uh, to say. And then there will be a, a discussion with the practitioners from different fintech companies, and also we have invited um, um, actually someone from the Ministry of Finance. Um, and uh, this is how we're going to proceed today. Okay, before I start with our latest findings, uh, let me briefly thank a couple of people and institutions. First of all, I would like to thank all the participants of the academic uh, workshop uh, this morning, and that you didn't uh, make this symposium turn out like here on the comic, and that uh, apparently didn't get out of hand. <laughs> so that was good. And um, I would also like to thank the Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition for hosting this year's event. Uh, I would also like to thank them and the uh, German Research Foundation for providing funding for the event. I think that was very supportive. Uh, third, I would like to thank all the people who have uh, uh, helped us to make this uh, event successful. And uh, uh, as you might have realized or not, uh, the event for us is still like a, a little startup. So we are, <laughs> we are uh, yeah, you might not have realized, but we are also improving. Um, and I think it's, it turned out quite well. And in particular, I would like to thank Matthias Schmidt, who did really an excellent event, and uh, or like organized an excellent event. And it was not like a crowdfunding; you only look at the funding success, but also like the turnout in the end was like really successful, like a venture capital exit with a really good VC in the end. So thank you very much. So let me start off with uh, how the German market has developed in the last uh, years. And uh, so we always track this uh, just to give everyone an overview of how crowd investing has uh, evolved. And what we mean by crowd investing is, in fact, that uh, everything that uh, is in some form an investment in this future cash flows of a, of a firm or of a project. So, but as an investor, you should actually receive the future cash flows because uh, what you might have realized is that in Germany, we don't call it equity crowdfunding, but uh, crowd investing course, we don't really use equity here. I will show you in a second why. And what you see here is the investment in uh, startup companies. So, and yeah, it doesn't look that impressive, I think. <laughs> so it's moving up. And if you go until here, this might have looked very cool. And if you're an economist and you would have gone on, you would have thought like, goes like this. <laughs> uh, so it didn't. And actually, you see it's uh, yeah, quite flat. And um, so what it actually, uh, uh, why this is an intriguing finding is that uh, here in 2015, we had the Small Investor Protection Act. And uh, so 
foremost installers might say, well, this has hampered us a lot to, to get funding, but uh, you can see that this was not the case, at least not for startups. Uh, however, uh, the market has developed, and what you see is here that uh, this is a different segment that has, has emerged uh, recently, which is uh, investments in real estate projects. And uh, so there have been some really uh, big uh, uh, yeah, quarters where there was a lot of real estate finance, uh, which quite similar, or which replicates quite similar the contracts you have seen in, in crowd investing for startups. And then also, Volvo's moved into different areas, like one of them is uh, eco and uh, social and movie projects, but this didn't really take off in Germany at least. And so if you uh, look at the entire market, so the market didn't really grow in 2013 and 2014. In 2015, there was a big peak, and I don't think that in 2016 we will see growth rates again, so it will be pretty much uh, around about uh, 30 million euros uh, that we will collect in the equity crowd. Okay, so here's the small investor protection. Okay, so let's come to the first study, and, uh, and this is joint work with uh, Tobias Schilling and uh, Lars Klön, and what you have looked at is, is the contracts in crowd investing, and you have already noticed, uh, Tobias mentioned that already, like in Germany, we don't have any uh, uh, equity shares sold uh, in a private uh, limited liability company. I mean, there have been some securities uh, in larger stock corporations, but this is really rare. So in the beginning, what happened was like we only had uh, signed partnership agreements, and the reason for that is uh, mostly that uh, if you want to transfer a share of a private limited liability company in Germany, you need a notary, and uh, you can imagine if you're selling a five euro share and you have to pay a notary for 250 euros, so that's not really uh, yeah, an efficient thing to do, and most of the time you won't make a return of a couple of uh, thousand percent uh, to get in the, the fees you pay for the notary. And what happened then was that silent partnerships kind of disappeared. And uh, in fact, here you see uh, we have uh, profit participating loans, loans starting off. And the major reason for that was that uh, you actually need uh, a prospectus is if you issue more than 100,000 euros uh, uh, with a silent uh, partnership, but with a profit participating loan for a long time, you could actually issue unlimited amounts. Until the time the Small Investor Protection Act kicked in in 2015, and then you could only raise up to 2.5 million. Uh, however, what you can see is that at uh, this time uh, there was only exclusively almost like uh, profit participating loans or subordinated debt. Um, the latter was mostly used by real estate projects. Okay. So study two is a joint work with uh, Matthias Neukirch from the University of Trier. And what we looked at here was we were interested in the pricing of shares and how they got uh, evaluated. You might know that if uh, in equity crowdfunding in Germany, how it works is that the portals and the entrepreneurs get together, they decide on the price of the startup, the portal says not too high, the firm says, oh, we are very, we are very uh, valuable, so we should have a very high price, and then they come up with a price, um, except for one portal, namely uh, Innovestment, uh, they have an auction mechanism uh, where the crowd could actually determine a price and uh, with a lower bound, um, and so you could learn something about the willingness to pay of the crowd for a share. So what you see here is like two different periods from 2011 to 2012, and 2012 to 2014, and this is uh, the number of investments an investor has taken, and here's the premium they have paid. And the first thing that is striking is apparently previously investors have been willing to pay more, now they are paying less, so the premium got lower over time. And the second thing is like there was apparently not much learning going on, so it didn't matter how many investments you have made, so the price you were willing to pay was pretty much the same or the premium you were willing to pay. Um, we also checked for other characteristics and what we found was like that the campaign characteristics like the funding goal and so on had an important impact on uh, your willingness to pay later on because it could be um, seen as a signal. Uh, sophistication had an impact uh, which was mixed uh, if you invested in real estate before, uh, that experience there, you weren't uh, willing to pay a higher premium, but if you invested in stocks before, you were willing to pay more in equity crowdfunding. Um, we also looked at funding progress and hurting, both had a positive effect. And uh, very interestingly, we looked at the stock market volatility in Germany. What you could see is that if the stock market volatility in Germany was higher, uh, then people were more willing to invest in equity crowdfunding. 
which is interesting because it indicates that the two are not uh, complements, they are apparently substitutes. So if volatility is high in a stock market, you move to a different market and are more willing to pay that. In a third study, <laughs> jointly with uh, Matthias Schmidt, we looked at the uh, local bias of investors. And uh, what you see here is, first of all, where are the investors coming from? And here is where is the money coming from? And if you see, like, uh, most of the money comes from, most of the people come from Berlin. Uh, however, like, if you look at Munich, it's not so many people, but more money. <laughs> and uh, Stuttgart is similar. And uh, so this is how this looks like. Um, interestingly, we also looked at how individual investors decided, and what you could see is that um, so individual investors mostly invested in local firms. Um, if you have an average distance, so they decided to invest in a firm which was mo more closer to them, um, and also their portfolios were skewed in this direction. Uh, we also found out that uh, it's not all the investors who have this uh, local bias. A uh, certain type of investors have this local bias more often. For instance, family and friend investors uh, invested more locally. Investors who uh, invested larger amounts also invested more locally, which makes sense because uh, if they invest a larger amount, then uh, they might also have to, or want to have more control over the start of their investment. And if uh, investors are more diversified, they also have a low, lower local bias which is, however, kind of uh, topological. Okay, so in a third study with uh, a full study, it's uh, Doug Cumming and Dennis Schweitzer. We were looking at uh, fraud in crowdfunding, and what we were interested in is we identified around 200 campaigns where there was obvious fraud on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And uh, so sometimes the entrepreneur just took the money and moved somewhere else, and uh, he didn't produce the product he was supposed to produce. And then we matched the sample with uh, very similar campaigns, and we wanted to see whether we could identify fraudsters from non fraudsters. So, what we found is first of all, if you're confronting a campaign, which is already a repeated campaign and not the first time, then uh, it was less likely that you actually uh, face the fraudster, which is not surprising. So, if you are a serial entrepreneur and if you uh, did a couple of campaigns, you're probably also self confident about yourself and you're just running the campaign, so you didn't engage in fraud. Um, also, interestingly, uh, what we observed is that there, if there is a fraudster, people most likely have a lower social media presence, which makes sense in economic terms. So if you are all over the internet, you don't want to be detected <laughs> so, uh, if you're a fraudster, so you're trying to hide uh, already previously. Um, also, probably not surprisingly, the campaigns of the fraudsters are poorly worded and uh, mostly confusing. And if you think about it, like if you don't know what you want to present and what you want to uh, create, you also don't know how to describe that. And Forza is trying to make up uh, for that by uh, gener generating more pledge categories and just generating more incitements to encourage the entrepreneurs to, uh, to encourage the investors to get into this crowdfunding campaign. Okay, so talking about crowdfunding, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Ethan Mollick. And uh, probably uh, all of you might know Ethan uh, already, however, I would like to uh, briefly um, introduce him. So Ethan is the Edward B. and Shirley R. Schultz Assistant Professor at the Wharton Business School. Uh, prior to that, he received an AB in Science, Technology, and Policy from Harvard University. He also received a Master's in Science and Management, as well as a PhD in Technology, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship in Economic Sociology from the MIT Sloan School of Management. His research interests include not surprisingly, crowd investing and crowdfunding. So he's also interested in innovation, uh, user innovation, entrepreneurial strategy, <coughs> and other topics. Um, he has received many awards. I would like to name three of them. Um, so this year, he became the Schultz Distinguished Professor of Entrepreneurship. In 2014, he was on the, among the 40 most outstanding business school professors under 40 in the world. Also in 2014, he was called the 30 most important influencer in crowdfunding. And as he just told me, in 1996, he got awarded the prize for the uh, worst website on the net on the web. He uh, created it. So. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first memes, too. <laughs> okay. So he published several articles in very prestigious journals, among others in organization science, management science, and probably most of you know the lead article from the Journal of Business Venturing and the Dynamics of Crowdfunding, 
an exploratory study, and Ethan is still exploring the crowdfunding, and today he will uh, present his latest work on crowdfunding. We are very much looking forward to your presentation, Ethan, and the floor is yours. Thank you.